and people will use it almost as a lake with their boats and their sailboats rowing, paddling, uh, swimming, all kinds of nice water activities. Generally, when the weather's a little warmer, you see it, all kinds of people out there, but most of the time on the weekends, it's really, really busy on the Mosul River. We're glad for it. Now, if you look across, you can see the first, or the last, as they may call it, of the vineyards along the Mosul that is terraced. You can see it's terraced with roads going through it horizontally, of course, and the vineyards are set up in a horizontal way. When you came down the Rhine, you see quite often, especially there by Beaupark, you see quite often vertical vineyards where the people go up and down the slopes. Here on the Mosul, we tend to go across the slopes quite often. There's a couple of reasons for that. Having worked in the vineyards, I much prefer going across the hill to do my work, going from one plant to the next, going across the hill rather than going up and down. I don't like going up and down. Um, when they go up and down, they can use certain machinery there. They can set up a tractor that will go down and, and you can winch up a plow up the hill to do some ground work. You can do the same things sometimes if it's not too steep here, if you've got enough of a track between each row, but that means an entire new setup for the winemaker. And that's what's interesting too, is that every winemaker here on the in, in Germany basically has his own methods of doing things. And every person decides for himself which way is the best way for me to be doing my vineyards. The vineyards here are owned privately by the people who basically work them. Um, the town we're going to visit today, Vinnegan, has 25 full-time winemakers there. They have the largest population of full-time winemakers in this entire area. There's no town that has more winemakers than that. In fact, if you put all the winemakers in this entire region together, you might get 25 out of them. And of course, with that kind of, uh, and I won't call it competition, they actually work together more as comrades, they have a very collective feeling about their, what they're doing together, and they they enjoy working with each other, and they help each other a lot. Here again, you can see how they, they have a, uh, the rows are far enough apart that a very small tractor could go through there, and you can see how they're starting to get up and, and over the tops of the wires. Pretty soon there's a machine, that, and you can see up ahead, they've already done it. These haven't been cut back yet. They haven't, the tops aren't cut back yet. Right up ahead you can see that they've been cut back. And I think a machine went through there and did those rows. Each one of those rows was done with a, it's kind of a machine that goes up and over it and cuts it with that. Very efficient. It looks more like a hedge now than, than, a, than a video. You don't tie them back horizontally to the wires like we do in the States. Well, they, they, the wires are as high as they need to be for the next year's growth. And so the, the wires are holding them up into those rows so that you don't so that you can actually still make it through there. They get so wild that you can't make it anymore. And you only need as much growth as far as the height goes as what you can use for the next year's cane to make it over the wire to do the bowing. So we, we don't tie them to the wires. We do more of an enveloping. Take, you take the row and you have two people and you pull the wires up and envelope them in. That's how we that's how we do the, the tying. Now if it's an individual pole, then we tie it to the pole. And it's it's one grapevine after the after the next. So it's a lot more work to do it that way. That's why a lot of winemakers have gone to the uh, wire construction. Now you will see some what we call the trier rod or the, the wheel from trier. And it's a it's round, it's, it's like a plate at the top of the pole, and they cut in the wintertime all around in a circle around that plate, or around that tire, and then the sprouts will come off in all different directions, but they stand about as tall as I am, and, and the grapes are up there in the air, and you don't have to tie them at all. So they're very labor, uh, non-intense. That's probably the easiest way you can do your vineyards. Most people won't do that until it's gotten to be a very old uh, vineyard that somehow got out of control anyway. If they, if they keep going up too high, because that is very high, uh, this wheel. 
now when you look across the river, you can actually see the first of the, of the larger fields that belong to Vinegan. Now these vineyards in the, in the very beginning are called the Vinegener Rutgen, and they have many terraces with the, the, the walls. You can see that above those terraced uh, vineyards are some rather wide fields at the top of the mountain. The terraced vineyards have a very high quality, and the flatter uh, vineyards at the top have a, a lower quality, generally. Every year is different. Depends quite often on, on how much um, rain and sunshine you have. This year, with all the rain we've got, these um, vineyards that are on the front of the mountain are at an advantage to a degree. They've got, a, they've got enough water and they're getting more sunlight. Even when it's a day like this, they're getting more sunlight than the, the vineyards at the top where it's uh, not quite as exposed to the, uh, to the sun. We are at about 49 degrees north latitude here. Normally this would be above the average wine growing region and it's only because of these steep hillsides that we can actually get the quality that we get up here. The hillsides actually make that tilting that they give us a microclimate that gives them enough sunshine to have their good quality growth. So in a drier year do you have to irrigate? No, we, uh, the Riesling grape has an incredibly deep uh, root system. They go down some 45 feet into the ground. Whoa. 45 feet? 45 feet. Huh. They have one of the deepest root systems that uh, exist. And they go down into the ground. Uh, these younger fields, you can see them right there is a very young field. Now when they first plant those, and if you have a year like last year was, last year was very, very dry, the winemaker can go in with a hose and, and water the plants. But we don't, we don't have irrigation. We could do it if it had to be done. We could do it by law. But generally, it's a very expensive proposition. And we don't know of anyone who irrigates here. I've never, I've never seen it done. But you can see there's always a patch of newly planted grapevines. Uh, it takes three years. When you take out a gra an old grapevine, replant it, it takes three years before you get a substantial growth from that grapevine, the newly planted one. So if a winemaker has, say, 40,000 grapevines, and he's going to work for 40 years in the vineyards, if he replaces every year 1,000 grapevines, in his lifetime he will have replaced all of the vines at least once. And 40 years is a pretty good lifetime for a grapevine. They can live longer, they will live longer if you don't take them out. In fact, you can see 40. here we have every now and then places where vineyards used to be. By law, they have to take the, um, the, uh, the grapevines out because no one's working with them anymore, no one's spraying them, no one's keeping them disease free. They become uh, a hazard to the other winemakers in the area. So they do remove any old vineyards that aren't being worked anymore by law. And this side of the river not being as um, well positioned has a much lower quality, yeah. and you can see they've never gone up very far, they, and they're, they're kind of the stepchildren. And this side step of the mountain will probably never be uh, reworked as much as the other side. The other side, the vineyards there are, are highly valued, and, and if oh, yeah. someone decides to give up their winery, the neighbor or a fellow winemaker will definitely take over your uh, property. They don't generally sell a vineyard. Generally, they'll rent a property or rent a vineyard. They're always, I think most winemakers here kind of fear the idea that maybe one day a child will come back and say, oh, I wanted to do that, and now we've got nothing. Now, when you look right here, you see an, an island full of campers, and now it's starting to fill up again. Two weeks ago, that poor island was cut off from the rest of the world and people were, were, were wringing their hands in fear that their, their camper caravan would be washed away. They're coming back slowly but surely now. It's looking more like a regular summer than what it did a couple weeks ago. It was, it was nasty. They, they have only one little road that they can cross, and it's pretty close to the river level, so it's, it became impassable, and they had a real hand-wringing time for a while. Now the bridge you see straight ahead of us, is the Autobahn Bridge for the num number 61. That starts down by Ludwigshaven and goes
goes up to about Cologne. And that bridge was built between 1969 and 1972. And it, if you want to think about what a, a kilometer is, from the left to the right across this valley is exactly one kilometer. That's how long the bridge is. It's a steel construction, the, the part that they're driving over, and then these huge cement base uh, supports. The, the color blue that you see was always painted blue, but the original paint job was done with a lead-based paint. And about 10 years ago, they had to repaint it. They had to remove all that lead-based paint and repaint it. And the actual cost was nearly as high as the, the original building. <coughs> Back in the 70s, it cost them 40,000 Deutsche Mark to build that. 40,000 million. Nay, 40? Nay, oh, wait a minute, I'm doing it right. 40 million, 40 million mark is what it cost. It was like 20 million euro. And to repaint it, it didn't cost quite 20 million, but to keep the whole thing in condition, they're constantly having to do maintenance up there. So we're going to park here for a moment because we have a find in all of Europe. It's called the Ulen. And you can see that the name is written there on that one wall. Right here, Winnegener Uhlen. Um, when you when you want to think of the name Winning, think of Winning, and then add an E-N, then you have Winnegen. And we call things when it's coming from this area, it's the Winnegener Uhlen. Oh, I don't know. The Walnuss, unsere Walnuss, have they a Sonderzeichnung? Yeah, they have no more yeah, neither one of us know. I, I know that I know that I don't think they're black, but I cannot imagine a, a law-abiding German saying they would be English Walnuts. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, right. Especially now that they want out of the EU. That's, yeah. that's like ordering an English muffin in Ireland. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Tiblish is not known for their wines, but they are known for their fruits. And another thing they're known for is the lovely view that they have to the village of Kobergandorf, which is where I spent 20 <laughs> years of my life. Okay. <laughs> and it's and it is a it's a pretty little village. You'll see it, it's coming up now. You know, Dieblich, uh, we always laugh with the people here. They don't have very they, every village here will have a wine fest during the summer. And people, when they come to Deebridge, they kind of say, well, we're not real proud of our wines, but that's okay. And a friend of mine said, well, it, uh, somebody from Coburn said, well, the people from Deebridge have a huge advantage. They have a nice view to Coburn Gondorf. And Coburn is a very, very, very old village. The castle that you see up on the hillside there is from the 13th century. And it's it is just a ruin. You can follow along the, the, the ridge there. Oh, There's yeah. a, a, a path of the of Christ going up there. So like a, a stations of the Christ going up the hill, and you can just see the rooftop of the St. Matthew's Chapel. Oh, when yeah. you're coming back this way, we get a better view of it from here. It's kind of covered from the trees. It's a very historic town. You can see down to the left, about halfway up the hill, there is a clock tower there. Mm -hmm. you see it. They built it high like that so Dievenich could see that clock tower. They didn't have a clock tower of their own over here, so they let them, they built it up high so that they could show their wealth over there. And if you look very closely, you can see that the church right in front of the clock tower has a tower on it. It's built in the 19th century, but it's crooked. The thing doesn't stand 100% straight up and down. See how it's crooked? Yeah. It's leaning back. Yeah. Now, Coburn has four different castles, the Niederburg, or the lower castle, the St. Matthew's Chapel, and the other two are but the far end of town. I'll point them out in a moment. The area of the bank that you see right now, right here next to the river, is an area that's reserved <coughs> for the habitat for a, a, a water snake that almost went extinct, but they were able to put in a, 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 some stones there and, and save that uh, river bank enough for the snake to repopulate. He's a harmless snake. He won't do anything. We nearly lost him as the part of the uh, ecology of the area. Now we're going to cross over this uh, golden bridge. In fact, they call it the golden bridge. And on the other side of the bridge is where the other two castles from Coburn Gondor are. The first one is called 
Schloss Liebig. And being a Schloss, it was built not for military, it was built more to show wealth. It's like something that uh, shows off a little bit. And the, the other castle is more of a borg, and it's a, it's a water castle built right on the shoreline of the Mosel. And when they built the road to go up the Mosel, they didn't know what to do to get around this castle, so they ended up going through it. So from right here, you can get a good view of both castles. First of all, the, the stone castle, and then right beyond it, down by the river, you see that it's more of a timbered house right on the river there. And you can see how the road is going through it. That's the water castle. So, on yet, and now we, we go up, and from here you get a fabulous view to the Matthias Capella. And the Matthias Capella is a very special one. It's see it way up at the top there. It's a six-sided chapel. It has um, the, the, the model for it came from the Orient and they brought not only the a remnant, a, rep, uh, a, a, a relic from the St. Matthew, but they brought the design for that chapel back. And 30 years ago that's where I actually got married. Oh wow. Up there at that chapel. Back then it didn't look quite as nice as it does today. They did an awful lot of work up there to make it uh, able to yeah, be there. They had a problem. They had put some supports from the side to, and they thought they were helping the chapel. Turned out that that was actually causing more damage than good. So they had to take those away and redo the actual foundation underneath. So they had to lift with just millimeters to spare to get the whole thing back down to a solid base. Now, Kobern-Gandorf is not only a, uh, one of the larger towns here in the Terrassen Bosel, it is also kind of our county seat. We have the administration uh, for this area is in Coburn, and also the uh, regional school. And in Germany, we have a very different education system what I'm used to, for sure. It took me a long time to figure it all out. When you're a young child here, you can start going to kindergarten at the age of three. You go to kindergarten until you're six. When you're six, you can start grade school. And that first four years, you go to a, 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 a school where you have one teacher and one class those first four years. It's a very stable environment, but if you have a problem, I'm, I'm, I really don't like this part of it. If you have a problem with a, a child, you end up, that problem stays with that child, never has a chance to change out from uh, the teacher or from the fellow students. And at the end of that third class, they determine whether a child should be university